Around middle school, I created my own trading card game with scans of hand-drawn illustrations and card layouts made in MS Paint. Today, I've got over a decade of professional graphic design experience under my belt, and I'm going to try to recreate it as a professional, real card game. And I'll take you inside my creative process along the way. Let's do this. My name is Taylor Thomas Smythe, and I'm a designer, author, and all-around creative. A little over a year ago, I released a video detailing how I made my own card game on a website called The Game Crafter. If you're looking for a quick overview of how to do that yourself, check out that video. I'll link it in the description. The card game from that video is called Triumvirate, and it's based on my award-winning fantasy series called Kingdom of Florida, which I'll also link in the description. Today though, I want to take you back to one of my childhood creations. Meet Xbots. I don't recall the exact details of how I got the idea for Xbots, but I do know it all started with a colored pencil drawing of a robot that I thought looked incredibly cool. And I'm realizing now was at least partially inspired by the look of Evil Emperor Zerg from Toy Story 2 and the Buzz Lightyear of Star Command spinoff. I was also really into LEGO's Bionicle sets and storyline, and the worlds of young boys in the late 90s, early 2000s were all centered on things like Pokemon, Digimon, and the like. From that one initial drawing, I came up with the idea to develop countless variations of that, and the name Xbots came along around the same time. Xbots is short for Extreme Robots. I think pretty much everything at the time was extreme something or other. I don't recall all of the rules or how to play, but I do recall one of the central elements of the card game was that there were different kinds of robots with different shapes for heads. The robots with the hexagonal heads were called Hexbots, the robots with the circular heads were called Spherebots, triangles were Tribots, and so on. I think it was basically a more complicated version of the classic war card game, where players take turns flipping over the card at the top of their stack and try to win as many hands as they can. And the player whose bot has the highest total score from the stats on their card wins that hand. The goal then was to play until one player had won all the cards. I think there were some other special cards and moments in the game, but that was the basic idea. So now my challenge is to take the card game I created as a kid and turn it into a professional quality card game that you or I can buy on the Game Crafter. While this will be fun for me to revisit and reimagine something I created as a kid, I also really want it to be helpful so that you can learn how to create your own games. So I'll be splitting this video up into several different parts so I can go more in depth on the various aspects of the game creation process. Please keep in mind that this is a creative process, not an exact science. So there are plenty of other ways to make a game. I just find it inspiring when I hear others explain their process so I hope the same will be true for you. If you do find this video helpful, or you want to see more of this kind of video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications with a little bell so you don't miss the next part in this series. In this first part, I'm going to focus on the brainstorming process, or how I come up with ideas for the game. In later videos, I'll bring you along as I design the cards and illustrations, upload files and set everything up with the Game Crafter, and ultimately teach you how to play the game once I remember what the rules were I made up decades ago. Whenever I'm starting a new creative project, I almost always start with a blank Google Doc or a note on my phone. This allows me to keep track of ideas as I go. Sometimes I don't always get all my ideas at once, and this just helps me have a way to catalog it. Um, with Google Docs, it's really easy to kind of rearrange things and copy and paste and cut things into different order. And that's really important for me to be able to have that flexibility versus if you are someone who likes to take notes on paper, which is fine. Um, I just don't love that as much because the digital formats give me a little more flexibility. Um, I also keep notes on my phone just because you never know when something's going to strike. Um, the good thing about Google Docs as well is that's cloud-based. So if you have the app for Google Docs on your phone, you can also add ideas on the fly, you know, if you're out um, mowing the lawn or something and have a great idea. That always happens to me for some reason. So for this card game, I started with looking back at the cards themselves um, and trying to remember other, all the ideas and things that I came up with when I created the game in the first place. Um, again, this was probably almost two decades ago, um, but I found the cards in a box of old things um, thankfully, I was like, I think I know exactly where they are, and I was just hoping they were there. I've moved a lot over the last few years, so I just wasn't sure if I still had it. Um, but thankfully, it's in this one box of things that I made when I was a kid. 
The first part in the, my brainstorming process for this game was cataloging ideas and words. Um, I started with just writing down everything I remembered. So there were like all the different types of robots, the hex bots, sphere bots, tri bots, two bots. I also wrote down ideas about like any character names. There was a, a villain called Gear. There was a kid named Mike who was kind of like the main character. There was like some sort of professor that was the one who either like built the robots or worked on them. Um, I remember there's little keys that had like the symbol of the different kind of head shapes for the robots and those kind of acted as some sort of power up or like a bonus you know power when you kind of go head to head with another player with the card. Um, there were also other kind of phases in the game um, like kind of like an expansion pack like there was I made kind of the initial cards and then I remember adding on like a new series of robots that had a, like a special name and they all had like a special power value on their card that none of the other ones had. Next, for a game you need some sort of goal and a storyline to go with it, at least some level. Almost every good card game has some sort of story to it. Um, at the very least it has a very clear objective and goal. Um, I was trying to think, the first game that came to my mind does not actually have a story to my knowledge, um, which was Uno. And that doesn't really have a clear story, but it has a very clear goal, which is to, you know, get down to the one card and then be yell Uno and then be the, play the last card um, and to be the first person to do that. But kind of a trading card game or something that's got a little more depth and like characters and things, there's usually a story that ties all that together. And a good story revolves around a good conflict. And by good, I just mean compelling, not that it's necessarily like a good thing that happens. Usually it's a compelling conflict involves bad things that happen, villains, um, bad circumstances, um, things that thrust your characters out of their normal lives and into kind of interesting circumstance that will warrant you telling a story about it. In the story of my original Xbox card game series, I remember that there was a main villain called Gear which is just kind of a funny, very on the nose robotic name that is funny that I came up with at you know 10 or 11 or 12 or however old I was at the time. And I'm pretty sure there was a human character that was the main protagonist. Um, again, it was a trading card game, so I didn't really develop much in the way of <clears throat> other storytelling methods beyond the game. So I had some ideas in my head, I remember, but I don't think I ever like really wrote a lot of them down. Um, oh, there was also, I remember, another human character that was some sort of kind of a traitor to the good guys. And so that created another element and layer of the storyline. Okay, so this is the Google Doc that I created to catalog the ideas for Xbox Extreme Robots when I started thinking about this project and this video series um, several months ago. So what I did was create a blank Google Doc um, everything has to start with blank um, that you add to it. Um, and I really just um, would kind of add things as I thought of them. Um, so the first thing I did was think through all of the words and associations I already knew that were part of the original game that I created when I was 10 or 11 years old. Um, that list was not super long. Um, so then I sort of, sort of tried to expand on that by thinking of words that felt like they would fit in that sort of robotic universe. Um, so that was like kind of cool sounding things like Cyberlords, Android, Mechanicus, Cyberboy, Animatronic, Tronic, um, and so forth. Um, but then it was also like really mundane words like upgrade, facility. I like the way those things sound. And like if I'm trying to think through what's the terminology that flushes out this story world and makes it um, believable and cohesive. Um, those are the sorts of things that I was writing down and looking for here. So some of these are like super tiny detail things and some are more big picture. Um, like the idea on this bullet point of, of giving each robot a story or backstory or character. Um, the cards themselves have a, the original cards have like a number. That's like all that denotes what the characters, the robot's name is. It's like two and which is not really that helpful. Um, so maybe I had this idea to give them like a more human sounding nickname that they can call them. Uh, or maybe they just call them things like number one, number two. 
Um, so I'll figure that out. But this, the goal of this is just to come up with lots of ideas. And so you can see I did like several pages of just this list. Um, and then I sort of fleshed out a little more. Um, yeah. As an author, I've realized that most of the story worlds that I've been creating are based somehow or somehow connected to the state of Florida where I live. Um, I love living here. So telling stories about this place helps me cultivate that love even more and share it with other people. Um, but I also have found that limiting myself to a very specific place keeps the story feeling grounded. Um, it makes it a little easier to kind of establish your setting if it's a real place to some extent. It can be real, but fictionalized version of a real place. Um, that's really helpful. If you think about a lot of kind of like superhero movies um, and comic books and things, a lot of them are based in these very like generic cities. A lot of them, you know, these, uh, they do have names and they're kind of a real, you know, Metropolis is the Superman one and Gotham City. Um, they're, they're all kind of based on real cities, but they kind of have this generic quality to them. And sometimes that can make it hard to like really care about the place and care about the characters and setting. So people have told stories for those characters and in those worlds that are very compelling and are, are really good. Um, but just as a rule of thumb, I think it's the, the more clearly you can establish a place, the better. With this particular card game, I didn't really have a place connected to it. So as I'm thinking about how I want to reimagine the storyline for it, I'm thinking about how can I anchor it in a place um, most of my stories do take place in Florida, so my gut is to locate this new version of the story and for this new game to locate it in Florida. And um, as I've been thinking about this over the last few months, while I've been thinking about making this video, I have decided that I want to set it in the Everglades, kind of out in this like kind of swampy, jungly area, just kind of off the grid. Um, there's going to be this place where these robots kind of exist and fight. Um, and I'll kind of get more into the ideas and the story as I go, but that's kind of the general idea. In conclusion to that thought, I find that anchoring your story in a specific place can help you more clearly establish the tone. It can even also help you come up with ideas that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of if you were basing your story in kind of a generic world that didn't really have any kind of real tangible inspiration to it. As this card game was based on a lot of the popular trading card games of the era in which it was made. Um, I was really thinking about the idea of like expansion packs and how you kind of, tr you know, trade cards and or find like special cards. So I remember that as a kid, I had kind of made expansion packs for this game. There were just like a couple special groups of robots that got added into the game later. So the introduction of a new series of robots called eBots that had, um, extra powers and i'm pretty sure the e stood for extra and they had literally like an extra power like that was like their thing it meant that they almost always beat whatever other card someone was playing so those were like the best cards you could have and so as i started thinking through the, a story and brainstorming a storyline for the new version of xbots i decided i wanted to think about it in phases and i somewhat arbitrarily picked five phases for this um, to tell the story over um, that would be like five iterations like five sets of expansion packs um, kind of five waves of new cards that you could add into the game over the course of the next several years like that um, as I'm releasing it as I was working on this outline I got so excited about the story though that I decided this can't just be a card game so I started outlining a more in-depth story that I will either want to turn it into uh, a series of novels, um, like middle grade, young adult novels, um, which would be like one book for each phase probably, um, and or uh, the idea of doing like a scripted podcast series, which would be really fun to do like cool robot filters and sound effects and things like servos. Um, the original card game didn't really lend itself to like a very comprehensive story, but as I sort of sort of flesh this out, like there's a lot more to it that got me really excited. Um, so yeah, 
So phase one will just be kind of the origin story of Xbots. And I was just talking about place a little bit earlier. And so I was decided to set this in the Florida Everglades. Um, the year is 2022. So I'm hoping to get this sort of out there in this coming year um, and sort of have it semi present day. So we have this idea of a pandemic has ravaged the world and the economy is tanked, forcing people out of big cities into the wilderness. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the Netflix show called Sweet Tooth, um, but I kind of like think it, about it in that vibe. Like it's kind of like a peaceful apocalyptic world um, where it's just kind of a lot of like greenery, um, the Everglades kind of grown over. Um, but there's also kind of like chaos happening where the cities used to be. Um, and so we have this character, this main story, the main good guy wants to use the winnings from the battles to be able to buy land and build a home off the grid where his ailing mother can finish her days in peace. Um, I haven't really fleshed that out, but that's, I think that's kind of like the main emotional core of the story. Um, this is a quick aside. Uh, it's always really important to have an emotional core to your story, um, to not just focus on plot, but to have something that really like motivates your characters and motivates you to care you the person who's experiencing the story to care about the character's story um so i had this idea a mysterious handwritten clue in the in the mail or radio transmission leads to the discovery of the abandoned robotics facility in the florida everglades believed to be part of a top secret u.s government operation built during the space race in the 1960s um so that right there just gets me so hype about this and makes this sound like so much more interesting than just like a bunch of robots fighting um this kind of story, like it feels very familiar. Like there's, it's a little bit derivative maybe, but it also feels like it's gonna have its own original spin. So as much as you can make your story original and give it some of your personality and your things that you care about. For me, it's Florida and I love kind of this mid-century aesthetic, um, it's 1960s. So I want kind of the world to be this almost like time capsule of 60s like retro futurism. Um, and then also mixed with um, this kind of like wild, like jungly Everglades vibe. Um, so basically the storyline would revolve around um, this, this kid or kids finding these old robots in this base, like boot them up and decide to just like, f they form this kind of underground ring of, I call it the Coliseum. It's kind of this battle royale between the robots. Um, and so there's all sorts of drama that happens with that. Um, see, phase one would kind of build and, you know, there'd be some revelations and um, kind of end like on a high, high note and a little bit of a cliffhanger that leads into the second phase. Um, I don't want to scroll down to these because I don't want to spoil them if you are following along and you want to enjoy these stories. Um, but what you need to know is I came up with five phases um, I actually gave them names before I even like fully knew what each one was going to be. It was kind of, um, sometimes I like to do that. Like if I come up with an interesting title for the phase or a book or something, it can like kind of suggest what a cool story idea might be. Um, it's always going to be open to changing that. Of course, if you know, the title just sounds cool, but it doesn't really, you know, have any relevance. So. Um, but what you should know are, is that what you, yeah, are the phases. So I'm calling phase one origins. Phase two is called spectrum war. Phase three is either dimensional chaos or dimension of chaos. Um, book four is called 2051 and book five is called infinity. Um, so I have all these lists of other ideas that I came up with, like some spinoff books and some in-universe things, um, the trading card itself. And then, so each of those phases would have after the origins one would have their own expansion pack that, um, I wrote here 18 or 36 cards that flesh out the new characters, locations, and scenarios from that phase. Um, you could also do booster packs and these numbers are kind of just based on the game crafter and the quantities like of how many, like the increments of quantities that their cards come in. Um, and sorts of different kind of packs you can get them in. So that's literally the only rationale for what those numbers that seem like kind of random, um, but they kind of come in like sheets of 18. So you kind of do in multiples of 18. 
um, yeah, so really excited about this story. And that's just kind of like a peek into my brainstorming process and some of the methods that I use to um, craft ideas for a story before I start kind of executing it, which will be one of the next steps. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This is my first video I'm filming in this new series, and I will hope to be getting you the next part in this series very soon. So make sure you're subscribed and like this video if you enjoyed it. If you had any questions or there's things you're really looking forward to seeing in this series and you want to make sure I cover them, make sure to drop those in the comments and I'll check those out. Thanks for watching and I wish you the best in all of your creative endeavors.